Uh, for those of you that had never seen me do anything before, everything I do start in with safety. Uh, to me, I don't care what you're making, if you lose fingers or eyes or anything else, that's the problem. The thing that happened with a lot of people, used to happen with me early on, is you start cutting wood without realizing what's going to happen when I get in the middle of this cut. And that thing kicks back at you and do all this other kind of stuff. Hopefully I'll show you how to be a little safer today with this. Every cut, I'm on, I wasn't going to do this demonstration because the older members have seen me do it so many times. But even when you see me do it, you still learn a little something uh, that you didn't remember before. But uh, for new members, showing you how, I never cut number one on any saw if I'm not looking at the blade. All right. On this saw here, when I make boxes, everything is turned this way because I'm right-handed. And I'm looking at the blade, which means I know where these things are. All right. And the other thing is, I never put my hands where they're within five inches of any saw blade. Period. So, and I don't have kickback in my shop. There's, I'll run this through my table so I take off what I want to take off. I don't have kickback. I'll run this through my table saw. All right, I cut it on this saw. So these are the things I'm happiest about above everything else is being able to play with my tools and be safe, but it allows me to do designs and stuff that look complicated, but nothing I do is complicated, and hopefully I'll show you today. But it means that people look at it and think you're better woodworking than what you have to be. I don't build my loose chairs and tables and all this type of stuff. But I do gift items, and everything is small, but everything I glue together comes right off of my soles. Okay? Uh, when I get through, I want to show you. Finishing is something that, is, to me, it's up to, if it has a nice looking finish, it's up to the person that built the pieces what kind of finish they want. I like for most of my stuff to look like it's polished wood. I don't want it to look like it's covered in plastic. I don't want to get rid of all the character in the wood by making everything perfectly level, more or less. I want it to be smooth, but I don't want it to necessarily, you know, look like it's just plastic. This is a letter opener. You can see all the little pits and stuff in the wood, but the main thing is when you fill it, that's what I'm looking for. And it has a lacquer finish on it. And when you were speaking of that a while ago, I use lacquer period. I don't use polyurethane for two reasons. I don't like the way it smells, number one. Number two, it takes forever for it to dry. Because the polyurethane dries from the surface down toward the wood which means it's tacky a lot longer than you, before you can handle it. If that gets a ding in it with polyurethane on it, you can't repair it to where you won't see that spot because polyurethane won't bond to itself. You understand what I'm saying? There'll be a layer of polyurethane sitting on top of the other layer, so you'll always see that spot. With lacquer, I can sand this down, put fill on it, put coloring on it, whatever, spread another coat of lacquer on it, you'll never know it. The reason is that when you've sprayed it, when you put one coat of lacquer on, it dissolves a little bit of the previous coat. I don't care if it's been on there two years. And it bonds to it, so now you've got a finish that's bonded together. What kind of I mean, lacquer do you use? Um, any kind, really. But I use depth. I spray a lot of stuff out of can. It's not the most economical way to do it, but if I'm doing four or five lead openers, it doesn't make, make sense to pull out a compressor and do all the cleaning and everything else. So. But remember, when you spray out of a can, the amounts of solids that you actually spray is about a third what it would be with one coat. So when I say I spray two coats, I might hit this six times lightly to get two coats out of a can. You understand what I'm saying? All right. And as far as, you know, one being harder than another, unless it's on the floor where I'm going to be walking all the time, that might be where I use probably... Uh, polyurethane because it, it, it's harder. But the hardness on the lacquer is hard enough for most things you're going to make. I mean, you, you, un, you understand that? Now, what we're going to try to do today, number one, I'm going to do some cutting demonstration first. Hopefully I'll spend a few minutes on that. And there are, there are several designs. Don't worry about the shape and all that. We're actually going to shape a lead opener today for you. But I want to show you how I make some of these designs. They're not complicated. Hmm. All right. And that's the secret. Once I learn how to cut stuff small and cut it, re-glue it, 
cut it to something, you know, different shape, re-glue it to something else. You can come up with designs that people sit and say, wow. And all you're doing is just cutting and gluing. So the secret to everything I do is safety first, cutting second, gluing third. And you can make a whole lot of designs. Everything here is basically made with three machines. I use a regular arm saw, which you do with a chop saw, table saw, and I use my belt sander. Well, more than three. I use my jigsaw a lot, handheld jigsaw. The reason I use it versus a, a, a band saw for a lot of the finished cutting, you can do it on a scroll saw, except the scroll saw will be slower for a lot of hard wood, and you wear your blades out faster. You know, if you're doing a lot of cutting with the hard wood. Isn't that right, George? Mm -hmm. All right. But with the jigsaw, now all jigsaws won't cut the same. I know the Bosch jigsaw does. And I got it years ago. In fact, my wife bought it. That's the last woodworking show she came to. Because she realized every time she came to woodworking show, she wound up buying me something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I didn't have a bandsaw. For years, I didn't have a bandsaw. So everything that you see here, basically, that has any kind of a circle or a curve to it, is done with that Bosch jigsaw. And I'm going to show you how we do that. And the reason I use the Bosch jigsaw is the blade moves a different way where it cuts smoother. So the teeth are not set out as much as other. Even when they, on the rough cutting teeth they got on the Bosch jigsaw, it still cuts smooth. All right. And uh, it's just a matter of you practicing and learning how to do it. But when you start cutting on the jigsaw, you have to remember one thing. The bottom of that blade, as you start to make a turn, it's not straight anymore. It's going to start flexing so that your cut, your cut is not perpendicular. But if you slow down, don't rush the saw as much, and you practice a lot, you can get to where the deflection is very little, very noticeable. So it will be almost perpendicular. You understand what I'm saying? This is just a matter of practice. So as I show you some techniques, you will have some failures, I'll have some failures, because I'll show you some of the failures and why they happen. But the, the biggest thing you have to do is practice with whatever machinery you're using and practice being safe. And think about these things before you do anything, okay? So hopefully we'll be able to get to it. I'm going to show you how these are three designs. This is two cuts on that chop saw. Then you turn the handle. This is three cuts on the chop saw. Then you turn the handle. This is two cuts on the chop saw. Now, the difference between this design and this design is just a matter of the angle in which I cut the wood before I glue the piece in. So if I cut it at an angle where this is, a, say this was cut at an angle like this, this was cut at a different angle. You understand what I'm saying? And that's all it is. You can create all kinds of different designs by doing the same things. People think I do a lot of cutting and gluing and stuff like that. Sometimes when I glue something up, I'm going to make five or six, seven different items out of that one glue up. And the other thing is, in my kind of woodworking, you never, never make a mistake. You change the design. <laughs> and it works for me. And a lot of times the design I change, to, I'm honest, uh, it comes out being better looking than what I was going to do in the beginning. And people will go, wow. Sometimes they don't know I've covered up a ding or some mistake I made and I had to put something in there. So it means you wind up being more creative. And this is not what everybody's going to do, but whether you make high-end furniture or whatever, it's nice to be able to go down in the shop and you can make a gift item like this. Sometimes a gift item like this means more to somebody than making them an expensive box. That your wife said, oh, that's pretty, but she would, might enjoy this more. And I'm going to say, earrings, small gift items, are things that make people happy, kids happy, old people, young people, and they're functional. Every letter open I make, I want to make sure it's functional. And you only use, on most letter openers, you only, I only figure two inches. Now I'm actually using open the wood, open the letter, and actually work. So uh, we'll show you how to hopefully make them strong, what woods to use, what woods not to use, particularly in the blade part. Some woods I can use if it's going to be thick, but when it gets to where it's going to be thin, I cannot use these dyed woods. They're hardwoods, but they are soft species of hardwoods. All right? 
when I'm going to use any kind of design in the blade where it's going to be thin, I actually rip the wood myself. All right, but I'm limited then in the colors I can put in, you know, certain designs as far as the blade is concerned. But it doesn't matter because I got enough color in other things, and I just like doing gift items that have color. Main reason when I started doing it, nobody, I was in the Woodworkers Guild, which I still remember of too. 25 years ago, nobody was making stuff of color. Everything was light brown, dark brown, beige, maple, whatever. Uh, when they started having wood with red wood in it and stuff like that, people looked at it like, wow, that's different. All right. Now everybody makes stuff with colors because you got to have all kinds of technology and things they can do. So enough talking. What are we going to do? What kind of glue do you use? I use white glue. White glue? The only reason I use white glue exclusively is I need all the working time I can get before the glue becomes tacky. If I use tight bond or if I use yellow glue, period, uh, before I can pull up a lot of these pieces, the glue is starting to get tacky and you never will get rid of the glue line. Now, like I said, the secret of everything I do is cutting number one, you want a smooth surface you can glue together. Number two, the glue line, once it disappears, it looks like the piece came out of, out of the tree like that. And that's the whole secret to a lot of colors and stuff is having clear uh, glue lines where you don't see a fuzzy look. If I cut them on the bandsaw, the cuts are rough. When you glue it together, it's going to be a fuzzy between the two colors. It's going to look fuzzy. Okay, what you do is going to, it's not going to be a crisp, you know, clean look. Uh, some woods, like I say, you'll see a little fuzz, but it's not enough to where the eye picks up a, a bad image of it. You know, it looks like a good, neat thing. That's what you really want is anything that looks neat. And I can take a piece of wood that you glued up. I'm not getting this. I can cut this. I can cut this at four different angles. I get four different looking type pieces of wood. And you wouldn't believe that some of them would be so wide. You wouldn't believe it came out of a piece like this. All right. You can cut it at more compound angles and get more designs. And particularly if you glue them to another wood. You can have colors coming in at a funny angle and people say, well, wow, how did you do that? All I'm doing is cutting and gluing. All right? So that's my kind of woodwork. I'm not a serious woodworker. I do fun woodwork. If I don't enjoy doing it and have fun, I don't worry about it. But I try to do something that nobody else is doing or some design that's different. So people look at stuff, and there are a lot of flaws in a lot of stuff I do, and I know them before I ever do them. But because I sometimes when I'm doing lead openers, I might be doing 50 different lead openers at one time. So you wind up rushing on your finish sometimes. You don't sand it quite like you should have. And you don't notice it until you spray a finish on it. And sometimes if I'm getting it ready for a show, it might be the day before I'm doing all this finishing, which means I I like to make stuff and don't sometimes don't spend enough time, allow myself enough time to finish. But I'm more concerned with the design. So. Uh, that's why I use white glue. All right. If you're making furniture and stuff, yellow glue is better. It doesn't run as much. But also, I wipe. I'll pass this around when I'm talking. This is the first letter open I ever tried to make. It means more to me than all the rest of them. Because this gave me a better feeling in here. I was happy. I went upstairs and showed my wife, you know, I think I can make some of these. All right. And it probably wouldn't open the letters we wanted it to, and this crew didn't know anything about what I was doing. And this is, and this happened to be probably 25 years ago. This one was around, maybe a year later or whatever, around the same time. I was trying to put a template on here and route it. That's what this is. So I bring it to show. The other thing is, I didn't wipe the glue off. That glue is like cement. It will put nicks in your planar blades and stuff like that. So everything I glue up, when I get through gluing it, I take a damp rag and I wipe all the excess glue off. I don't worry about what people say, you shouldn't put a rag on it, you ought to scrape it. That's for cabinets and stuff, not for what I do. If you didn't wipe the glue off of this stuff, you might well not try to make it. Because you are, you'll never sand it down, you'll, you'll get all the, well, you just have a lot of problems, you'll never finish it like you want to. So you can just pass those around. Uh, like I said, that'll show you some of the early stages of all, also how I did things. The other thing is, I'll show you the different stages 
that I use in doing the letter openers, and I do these. After the route, to get to this stage to glue my hat glue on, I do this on my router table. All right, and I got one elaborate sanding block I use. I do that all the time. Uh, well, all of these have nicks in them, what they be at the show, people drop them, I've used them all the time. This just has sandpaper on it, and it's smooth here. Make sure the sandpaper doesn't touch this. So that when I get to this final stage, I want this to be flat all the way up in the corner. So I can stick this on my table, put two sides of tape, and I can stand here now and I can, I can sand it all the way in the corner. And I want it to be kind of straight because I'm going to, well, it needs to be straight because I'm going to glue stuff on it. And if I got places, then it's going to show up in the handle. When um, I get ready to glue the pieces on the side, because this is solid all the way down through the middle. All right. So we'll show you how I go through the steps of that in a few minutes. Uh, I'm doing a little more talking. I wanted to do about some things, but hopefully there's some information you can pick up. All right. First thing we're going to do, for those that never, have never seen me do it, we're going to do some cutting. Oh, it's on there. Ah. I moved it. I forgot where I put it. What I normally do on your regular arm saw, table saws, you got a slot in the bottom that big. If it's a saw like this, I got a big slot. Everything I cut on my saws with all this stuff, table saw, wherever it has a zero clearance inserted, period. Uh, that way I don't have a little piece of scooting down in there and I don't have pieces tipping over right at the end because I cut a lot of small stuff sometimes. So what I'm going to do, now to center this, even though this has sandpaper on it already, Normally I put the board on there, a solid board, then I make a cut. Then I stick my sandpaper on either side of the cut and get it as close as I can where it doesn't touch. I like to see just a little smidgen of wood on each side of the sandpaper. That way I know the blade won't hit the sandpaper and do the blade. All right. Now, this has a slot in it. So I'm going to show you how. I didn't put it on because I want you to see how I do it. I got some, I got some designer glasses in here. I can't stand them. I bought these some sands, and I usually put one pair of those that I can see up close. They look funny, but I don't have to be moving my head all around trying to get to the bifocal part and all that stuff. Ted, does that sandpaper come with a sticky back? Yeah. Now, this is the open cut thing. Open cut. Uh, from what I understand, I'm no expert on sandpaper, so all I'm going to tell you is what I'm telling you now. Open cut, there's a difference in the way it sands versus some paper, sandpaper you buy. It, it wears out faster, but it doesn't sand as good. Okay, so I always try to buy the open cut paper. You list the lighter paper. Uh, they sell this here, and I think it's open cut. I'm not sure. All right. Uh, this is the Merco or whatever it is. I forgot what this is. Uh, I used to buy this up at up in Kennesaw, but now it's a wholesale place, so they sell larger quantities of cabinet shops and all that. They sell all kind of refinishing products. But it, it's sticky back. What I'm doing classes in my shop and I start uh, when I used to do classes in my shop. Now I've kind of retired from a lot of stuff now. I used to always teach people watching the class because some people are real new at what they're doing. When you get ready to change anything on a machine or do something, take this thing and stick it in your pocket. That way, if you get in the habit of doing that, you'll know that you've unplugged it. So what I was doing was unplugged before I started messing with it. All right. And they, they sound funny sometimes when they're too elementary. But how many times have you in your shop inadvertently turned something on? And if you got your hand on it when you turn it on, sometimes it's too late to move or say ouch. When you say ouch, you see the blood, you've already seen the blood. So, and I had an argument 
well, not an argument, but a discussion with somebody once that uh, Because this saw blade is just a little wider than the one I use when I made that slide at the woodworking show, I think. Huh? Yeah. They sell that here. Yeah. Uh, it's a. I like it over the others because it's a masking tape, two-sided tape, and it holds good. Doesn't enjoy it. And it doesn't leave that residue in the wood as much. Every now and then you'll get some in it. But you can actually, I can press two pieces of wood. If I put it in the vise and press them together, you can't even see a seam sometimes. You can hardly get it apart. That's why I have this putty knife. And I keep tape on it because it's sharp. And it will cut you. So don't ask me how I know that. But I put it on my belt sander every now and then just to keep the point sharp. But it allows me to get, when I stick stuff together with two sides of tape, it allows me to get between two pieces without marring either piece of wood. And I can get them apart, especially when I want to rip something thin. I can run, even thinner than that, I can run this through my plane or joiner when I need a thin piece, safely. I'll run, I meant to bring the piece, demo piece I had at home. I'll run this through my plane on joint until it's this thin. All right. Now, I, when I say that, people sit there, particularly experienced woodworkers, they look at you funny. It's easy to do. Would you run this through your joint? Plane? With some two-sided tape, I can stick this right here. I'm running through my plane. Long enough, is it? This is long enough. Oh, yeah, Remember, like this, is riding, this is riding on the bed. Okay, the pressure of the planar blade is in, only in one spot. The planar blade is actually, the pressure is in a spot like this. You understand what I'm getting at? All right, once it goes through, the planar blade is here. I mean, I actually, I got a demo piece that I got some pieces of half an inch by half an inch I run through the planer as a demo. All right. And uh, anyway, I won't spend time on that. That's another class. But uh, there's nothing too small for me to run through my plane or joiner. All right, the other thing, I'm not going to put it on the date. I have a little breathing problem. The doctors say lungs are clear and everything is clear. But I got certain dust masks that I bought that are better. I can't breathe with them on good. I got a little cheap ones I buy. I can breathe better with them, but I'm not making that much dust today. Plus, when I'm sanding there, it's going to be in the, sucked up in the vac, so I'm not picking up that fine dust. But that fine dust is the stuff you want to protect your lungs from, not the big pieces, because you're not going to inhale those. But that fine dust is over a period of time will cause you problems. You need to cover your eyes when you're cutting because if a little piece of wood, particularly on the table saw, a little splinter can come off that table saw and go right through your eye. And I've seen pictures of this with an eye surgeon and it started making me wear something when I'm on the saw. And you want to protect your ears. One little bit of, um, you know, an hour or something of loud noise won't do damage. But over a period of time, if you do it often enough, you will damage the ears. It's irre irreplaceable. And the other thing I mentioned about the eyes, when I found this out, 
I went home and threw everything out of the cabinet that had anything like Drano and stuff in it. The problem with Drano, if you cut your eye, it will heal. But when you do a chemical burn on your eye, it's irreversible. And people take Drano and stuff, put it down the drain, and the thing that he the demonstrator told me, same eye surgeon, first thing we do is look to see if it's working. And the chemical reaction comes up and burns the eye, and now you're blind. Okay, so that's just food for thought. Now, what I'm going to do... I made a cut. I know exactly where the saw blades are going to cut number one. Okay? Hold that for me, Carl. I won't cut you but once. <laughs> Now, if I cut this from the back side, it, was, it won't dark, dull the blade. If I cut it from the front side, it's going to dull the blade right quick. Now, using the factory side, I think I cut it wide enough. Hold that one more time for me. Okay, hold it side. Thank you, buddy. Is this showing on the camera good? I'll tell you why I'm putting this on here in one second. All the cutting I'm going to do on this saw is going to be in the middle of the table. I don't care if it's a right arm saw, chop saw. Whatever, I can do any cutting I want to do in the middle of the table. The reason I can do that is that if I find my stick, it would be all right. Uh, by putting sandpaper here. On the table, right underneath. Underneath. Oh, thank you. Where's uh, that 20 year old one with all the duct tape on it that you had last time? It's at home. <laughs> <laughs> I usually bring it to show, even, to put, even the one I use on my table saw is all chewed up. I usually bring those because they're good for a laugh sometimes. I just brought this one. Now you notice this is angle on the ends, and I'll show you why. Not only can I cut on the table, I can actually cut on the backsplash. This is a box that's cut at 30 degrees. All the angles are cut at 30 degrees on this hexagon box. I can actually take this box and make it half this big. I can take each one of these and cut them half as big with a 30 degree angle on this saw safe thing. My fingers are still never be within two inches, of, um, five inches of the blade. So every cut, I'm, everything I'm going to do here, and we're going to do it and stop talking about it. Whatever I'm cutting, Take this dial, we're going to cut it in half, okay? Good. For those that haven't seen it, we're going to take that half and cut it in half again. On this saw? Yeah, on this saw. Right All right. Well, the, other, <coughs> the other thing we're going to do. What kind of curve do you got on that blade? I don't know. <laughs> you know, the reason I say I don't know, I don't, I don't, I'm not being facetious. What you don't want is to uh, make sure I'm doing this right now. What, there's some saw blades, the, the teeth stick out more, it's more of a hook, like saying it right. Yeah. All right. That's more aggressive. It's going to pull the wood in faster. All right. On the rate long saw, or the chop saw, you want more, the teeth are not out here, they are, they are, I don't know if the mention sets in a little early, but I can't find the words I'm looking for sometimes. Anyway, it's not as aggressive. 
when you're cutting on your red long saw and you see the saw just ride out at you, you need to check your blades, you're putting the wrong blade on it. All right, you either get a, what is it, a negative hook blade or whatever it is. Then it won't slide. Zero or negative five. Huh? Zero or negative five degree. Yeah, well, I just call it a negative hook, but that's what it is. In other words, you should be able to, I should be able to, if my saw is level, I should be able to pull it out and that saw will sit right down and turn and not just ride out in the wood, okay? So if you got to hold it back as much as you're pulling it, you need to check your blade and stuff like that. You'll find you might get a little different cut. But the other thing we're going to do is we're going to not only cut that in half, but I'm going to stand it up and we're going to, that's too thick, we're going to stand it up and we're going to cut a piece like that, okay? Pass that around, you can look at it. All right. And it's, you know, people are, that hadn't seen this before, they're fascinated when you see me do it. But it's nothing more than all the cuts I'm doing, I'm doing the same thing. I'm putting it out here, I'm holding it with the stick, I'm looking at the blade so I know exactly where it's going to cut. But there's one other little, one other little secret. Well, that's the thick piece I usually got there. Uh, the other little secret is, I use two-sided tape to do a lot of stuff. So we're going to take a piece of wood. I cut off a piece, and I'll show you what we're going to do with it. What time? Is it? You know all my time messing around talking. I don't have nothing else to do today. Well, y'all tell me what time I need to leave. Three o'clock. All right. <laughs> now, the whole secret about cutting on the saw Whatever the height I'm cutting here, I got to have something of equal height here or a little higher. You don't ever want the backside to be low. If it is, as soon as that blade touches, it's going to snatch it. Okay? And what I'm going to do the first time, the first cut I make, I'm going to do it by putting one thing on this to show you how little pressure. But if you always, when you put pressure on it, if you see if you can move, if you can't move the piece, it's, it's, it's much pressure you need. Okay? Now the other thing is I want to make sure that the tip of this is not where the saw blade is going to cut the tip of this because I got sandpaper on it. The sandpaper primarily on the tip gets worn down. This is when I'm cutting a bigger piece and I need a little bit more to grab, but you only need sandpaper right here. <coughs> Serves the purpose. And the only thing I've done that allowed me to cut in the middle is create a device to hold this piece of wood. The sandpaper here is what's holding it pressure to keep it adhere to the sandpaper. That allows me to cut in the middle of the table without it snatching. That's plain and simple. That's all it is. It's nothing I do that's complicated. All right. And it's nothing I do that took me 20 years to develop the skills. In a way, you, the more you do it, the better you get at doing certain things. But that's why I say it's nothing I do that anybody can't do. All right. I said I was going to do the first one. Now, see, also by looking at this, I want to make sure that the tip is not out where the blade is going to cut it. All right. That was my fault before the saw ever touched it. Oh, we'll edit that part out. <laughs> Now I'll tell you what happens sometimes when I cut these out, if they're not parallel on both sides, sometimes you, you push it up a different way. If that makes any sense. But the other thing is, you know, most people that cut on regular long saws and chop saws, they act like they're racing. <laughs> Slow down, let the blade do what it's supposed to do, which is cut. You'll get a smoother cut. Uh, and can you see that? Now we're going to cut this in half again. And I'm, I'm doing the same thing I did the first time. By knowing where the 
saw was going to cut, that's all I'm doing is placing the piece. See it? Go ahead, pass that one around then. <laughs> All right, let's do one other thing right quick and then we're going to do a let opener. Too close for that. Dad, was that just a hardwood dowel that you originally started with? Did you just start with slicing? No, I, well, it is. No, no, no. What I did is uh, I actually make my dowels, uh, not make dowels, I make my plugs out of different hardwoods in my shop. And have a little container that a lot of times when I don't feel like doing anything and I got I run low on my plugs, I just sit there at the drill press and just make a lot of plugs out of scrap wood I got. And I throw them in the box, you know, things. So when I get ready to make something and use them, I got all these pieces. It's and like when I get them length or not lengthwise, crosswise, take the plugs and then yeah. just what what I don't no nah, what happens, all of these, if I do my plugs, I'm actually doing it. I'm actually doing it through the top part of the grain okay. so that the plug is smooth to glue into something. It doesn't matter even if I did it with the opposite part of the grain. Sometimes I will because if you take the same plug and one came out of, out of uh, sometimes the grain it has some interesting characteristics and it puts a design in your wood by being able to put those in there versus just looking at the wood grain all the time. I'm looking for more than just the color sometimes. Sometimes I want that pattern in the plug, you know, when you're doing something. So. Alright, now this piece, right, all right. Now this is the one I stuck a piece of two-sided tape on here. If you notice, whenever I use this, I try to put the sleeve back on it. This will stick in an otter and do more damage than a saw blade cutting your finger off. All right, I'm going to stick that right there. Now, with this here, I can run this through my table saw and take off any amount that I want to take off. Right. I'm going to put a pencil mark. Can you? Is that too close for the pencil? Can you see the pencil mark? Yes. All right. The crooked one? Yeah, I'm not going to cut it off. All right, I'm not going to cut it off. I'm going to cut half of it off. Okay. Then we'll cut the whole thing off and leave a piece like this. And the thing I'm doing here, as I say, if I was on the table saw, my fence is here. I, I can pull my, pull my fence out to where I know exactly where the blade is going to cut. So I can cut half of this off. All right? And I'm pushing this with my push stick through the saw. So my fingers are still not anywhere near the blade. I got an old crappy Duval table saw. I've only seen one other saw like it. What? I paid Duval, I paid $300 for it 25 years ago. A friend of mine's father had, and he cut his hand on it, he didn't have any more use for it. And it's a cheap saw. But uh, it took me two years to convince myself to buy a forest saw blade or expensive saw blade to go on the saw. When I did it, it made me a better woodworker right away because I could get smooth cuts. Belt dryer? It's a belt dryer. Now all I'm doing is using where I know the saw blade is going to cut and I'm eyeballing it so that I can see I'm going to cut half of that pencil mark off. Now, this piece is not as high, it's almost level with that piece. I want it to be higher as I say, you never want it to be lower. Alright, so now. What am I holding? I'm doing the same thing. My finger, there's no way this saw is going to cut me. 
I mean, I think this part is more important than the other, but I want to show you this. Let me rush up with it. Go ahead and pass that around and let you look at the mark. Now I'm going to do one right quick. When we, I don't have to do it, I can tell you. The same thing I'm doing here. Let me have that back, George. I can save time. All right, we're going to cut it off and we're going to leave a little piece like this. You know, I'm doing the same identical thing I did before. I'm moving it over to where what's going to be left is this. I mean, is anything, everybody, am I making myself clear? Why, why do we want this? Huh? <laughs> why do we want this? Make your Just to demonstrate, but I'll show you why in a minute. <laughs> George, that's for you to make your next Barbie furniture item. <laughs> oh, it, it works for me. Alright. Now, the reason I want that, sometimes I want to do something in my shop, I need a piece of wood like this. Well, if, it's, if I need it that long to glue in between something or that long, it doesn't matter. As long as I get a carrier board that's straight and flat. Say I got this and I need a thin piece. I can stick it to here and do the same thing I just did to where what's left is a thin piece. Or I can stick it to a longer board and what's left when I run through my table saw is a thin piece. Now the problem you have when it gets real thin is getting it off without tearing it up. And that's the problem with two sides of tape. Uh, not the problem, where's that piece? Let me borrow that so that I can move on. Let me borrow that back a minute. I mean, everybody understand what I just did? All right, let's let me move on. Loose pieces on it. Okay, thank you. Now, with, the, with this being real sharp, I can get up under here and get this off without tearing the piece up. Where's the tape? Saw that piece? Yeah. And even if I, if part of the tape came off with it, I can kind of peel the tape off. All right, let's move on to something else because we're going to do a letter opener. The uh, thing I want to tell you about letter openers is do's and don'ts. This was going to be I got two lead openers that are going to be two of my prize lead openers at a woodworking show. And when I did a lot of lead openers, and both I did something I had forgotten about. This one was real pretty, and I'm going to pass it around and look at it. There's a bookmark also I was going to get out of it. The two sides I wasted off, I made bookmarks out of. Okay? Before I shaped the blade. But the thing is that yellow wood is a dyed wood. It's all right in the handle here. It's all right right here in the blade. But when, the, when I shape that blade to be thin, that yellow wood is going to split right down the middle. And that's where I got this piece to show you. This is that same wood. The fibers stuck to both pieces. So the fibers themselves split. The joint didn't come loose. All right. The fibers, the yellow fibers were on both pieces of wood that came off. So that's why I didn't finish shaping this handle. I realized I made a mistake. And that was a lot of pretty work. But that was the other thing. And there's another one. This was going to be a letter opener that had pretty colors in it. And I'm like, we're going to do one like that similar. As I cut the designs and then glued them in, it was fine. But I had forgotten this is dyed wood. And when the dyed wood all came together, you know, where you cut different pieces at different times, the dyed wood is what really kind of fell. If you notice, I got another piece where the dyed wood is gets kind of stuck to all the pieces because it didn't the glue. I mean, it's just the wood is too soft. All right, so there's some things I can do with it. This is not lost because I'm going to make some earrings out of it. Okay, I'm going to make earrings out of that. That would be a pair of earrings, a two pair. So it's not lost. This was going to be another one that was going to be real pretty, and the blade part was going to be this way. Which way was it? Anyway, it was going to be one way. But as I turned it, I actually turned it. It was another piece in here I made some earrings out of. But as I turned it, I turned this down a little too thin, too small. And I always test my lid openers when I get through a tin bar. I, make sure, I want to make sure they're strong. This one was not. 
Now, I can still probably use it on what I do on some designs I make. And I think this is worth showing. Carl probably can I have any. Well, I can show you on this one. And this is not a good one. This is one I tell you that I didn't sand it good here. And I was just playing with different designs and different things. But right here, on most of these lead openers, when I I'll make a handle, all right, and I have wood, I usually put a screw right in here, sheetrock screw. You drill a hole in the center of this one. I usually run the screw up in there. All right, I run the screw up in there, then I back the screw out. I cut the head off the screw, and I put it in backwards with some pliers. So the screw is in this part. And when the hole is drilled in there, once I put my glue on it, if I wanted to put several different colors between, I'll drill a hole in it. This doesn't have to be the same size as this, it can be larger or whatever. And once I put my glue on everything, and I screw the thing together, this becomes my clamp. This clamp holds everything together until it dries. But it also means that I can, I can glue in grain to side grain, and I'm giving it strength by putting that screw in there, and nobody ever knows it's in there but me. All right. But what I don't, don't want to do, I wouldn't turn this handle right here where the screw is. I always come down to where the shoulder is going to be below where the screw is. You understand what I'm getting at? So that this part, this and the shoulder is strong. The screw makes this strong. So I will do, uh, there's one where, I, when I did these lead openers, this picture looks funny, depending on the angle they, they were taken. But these are lead openers where you're looking at the end grain. All right, all the side grain, like this, you're looking at the end grain of the wood, you know, and some of it is turned, but the part that's glued together is still the side grain, glued to the end grain of the blade. You understand what I'm doing? All right. Any questions on that? You can look at the pictures. You can pass it around, Joyce. Somebody will look. I put the pictures of the lead openers in the front. Now, let me mark one right quick and show you how we do different designs. What you want to do when you're looking for wood, I'm looking for, I want the blade to be pretty. So all the character of the wood, I want to show on the side of the blade. So I'll pass this around because I got some things on here to show you. This is maple. I glued this together with something else, but it had a bad joint in it. So I can make three lead openers out of it. All right. Now, if you look at the side of here, this is a pretty part of this wood and not the grain. So this is the part I want to show up as the size of the blade. What kind of wood is this? This is maple. maple. Uh, <laughs> this is cherry. And I, unlike when you do furniture, I like to be able to have the sap wood and a different contrast of wood in the piece of wood and making a lot of stuff. It has more character. Now, if you were doing furniture, you might not want all these different colors. That's why they stain cherry dark, try to hide some of that stuff. But even in the cherry, this is the pretty part to me and not the green. So, like I say, you never mess up anything, just change the design. Now, this one, because of the fact it has some lamination, the one in the center would actually be the size of the blade. Not because this has some walnut that I ripped. So I don't worry about the blade getting thin and splitting. So I'll get three lead openers out of here. But I just want to show you, you know, in selecting your wood, you try to figure out what's going to show the best for what you're going to do to have the best effect. Because that's what people look at. They say, oh, that's pretty. Sometimes they're not talking about this. They're talking about the pattern they see in the wood. All right. Any far. I've done a lot of talking. I haven't done anything other than that little cutting. Let's make a design. We'll do a design like that. Okay. As I say, this is three cuts on this saw. Now, once you cut it, do the first cut. Now, what I need to mark it first. Now, most people, if I say, well, this is going to be a half an inch and this is three inches in between or whatever, most people, that's the way they do things. Now, what I try to do. I try to simplify everything I'm doing. 
if I would take whatever measurement I'm going to use Now that's the way I do that first mark. I don't know what it is and don't care. This is going to be my cap. The dead center will go in here. Once you round the thing off, the cap might wind up being only a quarter of an inch on the top when you get through. Do I have one with a cap on it? Other than the picture? No, I don't. All right. This is going to be the design in the center. All right. Say so we're going to put a design on it. Let me put my other mark here first. That looks good enough. It's real hard in the drive. I mean, if you want them sticklers to say, well, it's got to be exactly two inches or whatever. Measures. I, I'm doing it in a hurry, so you get the idea. Not real pretty marks, but you get the idea of what I'm doing. And I have a wider piece. So now I mark this and this. My blade is going to, my design is going to be here, okay? And what I, what I do with my design, if I was drawing it out to where, I'm going to draw this out a little bit so you will get an idea of what we're doing. I'm going to do this on this side. I'm going to do it on this side. Because what I want is... I got to be able to cut it one way. I got to be able to cut it the other way to get this. And that's all I'll do. Now, when I come to, here we are, I'm gonna bring it to you. <coughs> this is the template I made up the first time. But I'll show you a different way to do it where it's easier. Where I actually had to put the different marks at the different spots. You understand what I'm this my, my fence is here. This is where my blade is going to cut. So what I had what I was doing. Now you notice I'm pulling this saw down this way. Alright. I've just lined it up. I can stick this down with two-sided tape, or I can put a clamp here, it doesn't matter. All right. When I slide this up to this mark, in this arrow, I'd have to do each side like that exactly. I mean, I only have to do it twice, once this way and once that way. All right, but I do it at different times, because once I cut one, I have to glue it on. When it dries, I have to turn it the other way and do the other cut and then clamp it. And I'm going to show you how I clamp it so that the sides don't slide all over and do this and that. It's real easy. Uh, what I do now is, and I drew this to let me know what kind of designs. The reason I got, I had to cut this off again. But the reason I have uh, the tip walls up to here. But something happened, I had to straighten it out again. But uh, depending on what kind of design I was making, is to whether or not I bring it up to where we do. Everybody understand that? What I do now is this is another design that I don't have it on there. Um, they gave me a different angle for cutting. But what I did is I rather than cutting out each one for what I want to do now I can do this. All right. Once I cut it here. All right. I have to tell you, we just cut. It. Now think. Of, I want you to think about one thing I'm doing right now. Other than. Other than I only have some sandpaper here to keep this from sliding. Let's see if we can do it without it sliding. But uh, the, the sandpaper is holding this jig in place. 
So if I only wanted to do one cut right quick, I can stick it on here and do a cut. I don't have to change my sandpaper or do anything else. All right. So this is my first cut. If I want to put some color in between, I'm going to cut off a piece of whatever I want to put in between. I don't want it to come all the way to the end. If I make it come all the way to the end, if it slides a little bit on me, it's going to stick out to where I can't keep this flat. All right, But I will cut off a little piece for demonstration purposes. doing this out here so you can kind of see. This is what we're going to clamp so that we got something like this. And so I can put any kind of designs in between there and clamp it and then people want to know well, how did you get the little black in there? How did you get different designs? And all it is is some pieces I cut off of my lead open handles. Now you remember when I stuck it, the little piece on with two sided tape, you said, what you going to do with that little piece, George? I take two of these. You can't glue this in between anything. But I can stick this, I can take both of these, stick them on another piece of wood. And I can make both of them just thin and straight. Now I can glue them on something. You understand where we're going with this? Now, to create a design, once I get them both thin and straight, all I'm doing is flipping one so that it's wrong in. I make two different designs. I can do a design like that. Oh. I don't know if it shows up better on there, Carlo. Yeah. Okay. Or, as I say, I can do it, this show it better. I can do a design like this. Or, I can do a design like that with just the same cut. Now that's what you will see in between either here or in here where <clears throat> What time do we have to be out of here? If you stay past one, you got to buy a lunch. <laughs> I said, okay, I won't actually shape a lead opener for you, but I think what I'm doing now, showing you how to do some of these little simple designs, is equally important. We don't really have a time that we have to go to. Some people have to have okay. uh, things for the family, so if somebody gets up after 10, they quietly leave. Well, can, hopefully we're going to try to wind it up by 10 anyway. That's fine. To be able to put this piece in here, it came off a piece like this, and I can actually just cut this. Now, with it being straight, I can cut this here, and I automatically got everything at an angle. I can cut it here, and everything is automatically, all right? With this piece of wood here, to most people, this is nothing but, this came off of a bigger glue up. Well, it came off of something like this. So when I glue up, people don't believe this, when I glue up a piece like this between earrings and other stuff I can make, this winds up being worth four five hundred dollars all right? It's, it's just amazing. And people think you do all this funny glue up. I'll, I'll spend time gluing up blocks like these because I'm going to make stuff out of them later on. And that's, I might spend a whole day doing them, ripping the wood, putting it together, gluing it together, and planing it. And so I have a lot of different colors when I get to start making stuff. Uh, but you get the idea of what we're doing. That's the reason for using the two sides of tape on there on the saw, is I can take rough pieces like these and... Uh, and these came off of a letter opener. If I had a, if this is a letter opener here, before I get to this stage, I had pieces maybe, I had ripped, well here we go. They were thicker than this, but I had ripped, no they were like this, okay. So if these were on the side as letter opener handles with a thin piece in between, I take my jigsaw and cut off some of the excess before I start shaping. Well, this is the excess I cut off. All right? 
and I can make something else out of these. I can make earrings out of them. I put them in between things. So that's the way you wind up doing a lot of stuff. All right. I lost my train of thought. What was I fixing to do? Oh, glue this with a piece. All right. The way you glue this. I meant to cut a big one. You want to be able to glue it where it stays straight when you get through. Okay. So I wind up with, I'm going to come around that side of the table. All right, let me show you. See if I put one back to you, Carl, that won't work. Get two thick pieces of straight. I'm going to move them back from you in just a minute. This is just tight enough right now to kind of hold that in place. You understand what we're doing now? Once I put glue on here and glue on here, and I put the whole thing in here, what's going to happen is I can pull it this way, but I need to pull it up that way. Let me use the small clamp. You probably see it better. Alright, this is assuming I got pieces in between here, okay? It's easy on the work table. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to do it so as you can see what I'm doing. No. Nah. I'm trying to do it to the side so you can see. I'm going to use this small clamp. Okay. That's what I'm going to do. When I'm in the shape. So what you do is, I'm tightening this just enough to where this doesn't spread on me. You understand what I'm doing? But I still want it to be able to slide when I tighten this clamp. This clamp is the one I'm tightening
to where I can push it up. All right. And you only want to push it until, as you wipe it, until your glue line disappears, then you just let it sit. But I want to make sure that this is kind of tight, and I want to make sure that this is, you know, tight enough. And that's the way I clamp. How do, how do you clamp that center piece from sticking with the glue to the outside piece? All right. What I do to these pieces, normally I put some wax on them wax before. Wax paper or wax? Well, I, use, I just put a little wax on the wood. And when I get through, if I want to use this wood again, I'll skim it on the saw to cut that. Because the wax is only going to penetrate just a little bit out, you know, out of the layer. I imagine wax paper yeah. probably works. Well, wax paper is hard to deal with. I got enough yeah. stuff moving. Yeah, okay. So what I'm, another thing is, as I'm doing this, sometimes it looks like they want to slide up. So before you get it too tight, you're constantly pushing them down. All right. And I'm usually going to, so even if the pieces are sixteenth away from all all sides. I'm either going to, I'll either sand it or turn it. So you're going past that little bit, that, you know, the pieces you put in between are not covering. Is that clear, everybody? All right. So after but, this one dries, then you rotate it 90 degrees and cut again to get to make the X. And if there's a little roughness on it or whatever, sometimes, sometimes you put a, uh, I don't care how you try to do it, your piece is not perfectly straight. Sometimes you might have just a slight crook. But if the crook is too much, that means your glue joint is probably not going to hold it. But a little bit of a crook is fine. You have to kind of do it enough to judge whether or not it's going to be all right. Because what you've done, you've actually mashed the fibers in a little bit more on one side than the other one. But if it's too much, that means you got something that the glue has gotten hard, but glue won't fill up gaps. That's why you want thin things of glue. The glue needs to go into the fibers on one piece of wood, into the fibers of the other piece of wood, and that's really what holds. Mm -hmm. And if it's glued properly, the glue joint will always be stronger than most of the wood you're going to use. So if the glue joint comes loose, it means something we didn't do right. Okay? Uh, now, we're going to turn one. Are you ready, Jimmy? All right. What I've done... <coughs> Oh, can you see that design right there on that glue? You can go closer if you want. We can see it on the screen if you can come right here. I don't have enough cord on it. Okay. All right. What I've done, what I drew on here, there's a, this is this design here. Now, almost. What I did on this one, there's a center line here, okay? When I drew my circle, I kept the circle to the outside of the center line. Now, if I, want, if I drew the circle from here over the center line and over the center line, you wind up with something like this. So by doing the same drawing and the same thing, I can create different designs on this. Anybody? Everybody, am I making myself clear on that? So just to draw this, now when he starts turning all this, it's going to disappear. But this is if I have already glued the wood in, and it's dried all the way around. Uh, and what would happen on this one, once you cut it on one side, and it dries, you glue in these, these two pieces on, then you turn it this way and do the same cuts. So that when you turn it now, you're going to have, you won't just have ovals here, you'll have ovals on this side right here, but also have ovals on it. So the same design you see right here, I can put the same design here by doing the same thing. Or I can make the design different. I can put this design here, and I can put that design on this side. And that'll make people even go, wow, even more. There are, there are ways where I could actually cut this thing in here. I can cut it where it goes here and over to that corner. And I can do that. Like I can do this right here, but I could also do a cut where it goes over to the opposite corner. And when you turn it, you would have all these little things in the handle. And people say, well, how did you do that? I said, with well, a jigsaw, you really blow the mind in. Okay. You're doing all that cutting while this is still a square piece. No, no. Yeah, it's a square piece when I'm doing all the cutting. 
I cut everything in, glue it, turn it a different way and cut it again and glue something in again, cut it, turn it a different way, glue something else in. And the more you do it, the more you will get ideas. So, oh, wow, I can create this design. Sometimes you have no idea how it's going to look when you turn it. Oh, while I'm speaking of this, these were some prototypes I was making. I did a class up at John C. Campbell, and there were some people that made, they made some letter openers that looked like knives. And some of them were quite unique, so I played with some of the designs. That's why you see some funny-looking blades. That was a lady bought one one day, and uh, it was kind of like this, that little fat blade on it. And she said, you know what I'm going to do with that? I said, no, actually, I didn't care, <laughs> you know, but she said, I'm going to use it for a butter spreader when she's doing dinner parties and stuff. You know. Uh, you use butternut wood? <laughs> mm, no, what is this? This is... <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I don't know what she did. Anyway, but uh, as I say, you can play with all kinds of designs on your handle. This will still open a letter. Because as I say, you're dealing with the first inch and a half, two inches, which really going to cut you open your letters. So you can play with whatever you want to do. But I was getting to it. When I actually drew the handle out and realized that I had the spur center in here, the dead center, in here, then I realized that, well, I'm going to lose my design if I cut that thing off but it had holes in it. Just so, plug what, it. yeah, I plugged the hole. And it's, this is Paducah. It was real red in the beginning. This a few years ago. And people will look at it and say, wow, how would you do that? <laughs> well, that's to cover up with a mistake. Like I say, you never make a mistake, you change the design. design. So, what we gonna do, yeah. so like I said, what we're going to do now, once he turns this, turn the handle down, you don't have to turn it down real small, just enough for me to demonstrate. Then I'm going to actually waste away some and show you how I'm going to shape the blade on the sander. That's between, you want it between? It doesn't matter. Here? Yeah, okay. that's fine. And... Uh, I'll be talking if you want me to while he's doing yeah, it, unless you want to watch him turn. Don't talking. listen to him, don't watch me. <laughs> You're on a camera. We have some other designs. As most of you know, that's generally square across the end. I'm going to use a spindle skew now to see if I can. A spindle skew is shallow dished and rounded across the end. Give me a little better control, maybe. There, we'll smooth that out and let Ted see if that's enough for him. Okay. It's going to be fine. Is that the depth of that circle that you made on there? Uh -huh. 
that cut to the depth of that circle? Or uh, no, it might not be for demonstration purposes. But if I was going to, actually, when you do it, when you got to, you can see the designs you got in it. You cut it down as far as you want to. What I did, and I'll show you what I, what I mean by that. When you're doing too much stuff up on you, you get stuff in. Okay. Now on this one, when I turned it down, as I was turning, I noticed I wanted to keep that. See how that became a diamond like in there? So that's when I stopped turning. Same thing on this side. What I was looking for is, you kind of look at the wood you got glued together, and I thought that was going to be kind of attractive, so I don't want to cut all the way through it. You understand what I'm getting at now? So a lot of times when you're turning with the designs, you turn it down to you get to where you see something you like and you stop. And see, this would be cut off, would have been cut off, and these I'll make a pair of earrings out of. But that's when I'll cut this off and round over the, you know, the end of it. Now, the other thing I want to tell you, this has been sanded to 120. There's nothing, on, none of those other than the sand that passed 120, 180 at the absolute most. But the reason I know they're 120, because I finished sanding them on this sand, on my palm sander, and I only used 120 grit on it. It's as fine as you sand? Hmm. The only reason... It's up to you as to what you want to do, but I got a friend of mine named David McDonald that does finishing. It took him a long time to convince me not to sand past 180 grit on most stuff I do. You learn how to finish the finish and not the wood. You're not getting the wood as smooth as you want, but what you're doing, the higher grit you sand to, the more you're closing up the pores on the wood. So your finish is just sitting on top. All right. So it's your finish needs to be able to lock into the wood fibers. You understand what I'm saying? But it doesn't matter. It's up to you as to what you want to do. That's why I say it's a matter of personal preference. A lot of people look at some things I do. Some things I do are not sanded enough. That's because I was rushing. I was making nine meat at one time. But uh, for what I do, my finishing is the way I want my finishing. I don't care what anybody else think about it. You know, everybody, it's an individual thing. So uh, as long as it feels smooth and look like, you know, the polished wood, that's all I want. Now, what I want to do, I want the blade, I want the blade to be straight with the handle. So, with just eyeballing it, let's get a little straight edge. What I want to do is, I'm just kind of eyeballing this with the dead center. That's about the center. That's about the center. Now, you can take a piece, since the handle is turning, this is for demonstration purposes. You can make the line all the way so you can see it. But what I'm doing now is, that's my center line. I want to waste away all of this excess wood on the side. So this is what I want, oh, I'm sorry. It's not showing very good, hold on. That's just a rough idea. I want to take all of this. Let's show up a little better. All right. So this is what I'm going to cut off with my jigsaw. Now, if you you got a bandsaw, this is where I will cut that off with the bandsaw because it doesn't matter. I'm going to sand it smooth. 
All right, I don't have a bandsaw here, but we're going to use the jigsaw. Let's see, Carl, let me get my plug reach over here. Okay. I did something to this thing, and I had to short my car, and I had to cut the end off. Anyway. That happens with my key. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I cut in my shop. I normally just hold this thing and I do my cutting. And even though I'm cutting toward my hand, what's going to happen before this thing hit my hand? It's going to hit the table. All right, so I don't want to cut that table, so I'm going to put this here. I mean, I will do some freehanded wasting away and doing some stuff on there. Thing. If I wanted to put, I'm going to do two things while I'm doing that one cut. Alright. To put curves and stuff, normally I don't have to draw a line, but you want to draw something, you don't want real sharp curves, you want a slow, subtle type curve. Don't worry about staying with that line. That's just a guide to give me an idea. Dude, I might wind up coming down here and going like that. It doesn't matter. But that's just to give you an idea how you can mark it. If you want to try to cut on the curve, that's fine. If you need to use something uh, uh, that has curves in it to mark it, you know, that's fine also. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I cut, I'm going to cut this to where we're going to glue the two halves together, supposedly. And I'm going to waste the on this. I've cut it down that far. All right. I need to finish. I stay on this side too. I'm sorry. Can you see this car? Mm -hmm. All right. All I've done now is put my hand behind here. You know, my table is a little bit lower, so I can work. I'm trying to work where you can halfway see too. The reason, the reason you got that shadow, the thickness of this blade, if I try to turn too sharp, the back part of the blade is hitting, is rubbing. It's hot too. And uh, the blade gets hot, George. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> All right. So what we got, what we basically got now is, that's the rough, I've just eaten away some wood and that's a rough shape. All right. Now we're coming over here on the belt sander. Oh, let me cut this while I'm doing it. I'm not going to cut it all the way through. I'm going to show you how I do my curves. Why would you use the scroll saw? If I got a scroll saw, I don't have one set up, a band saw, I can do that. Yeah. Now, the reason I don't use a band saw for the one I'm fixing to do now is the edges of the wood is too rough to glue something together. It's going to look fuzzy. On the all band right? saw? On the band saw. Now, on the scroll saw, it might be smoother. But if I tried to do a lot of these with the scroll, so I'd be all day long and I'd wear out nine million blades. You know what I'm saying? Cutting speed, you got no cutting hardwood with a scroll saw. It does take a lot longer. That's what I'm saying, so I'm using hardwoods because the teeth on the scroll saw are smaller. All right. 
and they're going to wear down faster. I can do this, like I say, on my jigsaw. I don't have a problem. I got some big blades for you. <laughs> but I want them to cut. They have to be able to cut smooth enough to where the surface is smooth when you get through. About the size of your blade. Oh, okay. Now I can do that that way. Normally, I will put it in my vise. Normally I put it in my vise and I cut up to here. Now once you cut up to here, if you keep cutting, the vise is squeezing in so it's going to bind on you. So when I get to a certain point, I will stop. Now what I have, I usually have a little piece of wood. It's the same thickness as the kerf. Alright. And this is a little wider, but it might work. It's a little wider, but it might work for what I'm going to show. idea of what I was doing, right? Okay. Now, I'll pass this around starting here. What we have right here is where it stopped and start doing that. But if you look at here, this is not as smooth, but usually when I cut it, it's smooth like this. All the way so that I can actually glue wood to it and you don't have a thing. This is the way the bandsaw is going to leave it. This is the way it the smoothness is the way it comes off that saw. So you pass that around, but that's the way... So you, Ted, you put a thin piece in there and clamp it yeah, together? Yeah, what you want, let me have it back for one second. You can, depending on your, your, your curve, is how thick of a piece you can put in there. Now you can put as thick of a piece as you want to put in there that will, will pull together. If you can't pull it together with your hands, too thick. All right. But the thinner the pieces that you glue into something, the more it looks like your master woodworker. It's surprising. Everybody glue thick stuff together. That's not hard. When you start seeing thin pieces, it draws people's attention more. Because you don't see thin pieces in stuff as much as you do thick stuff. You understand what I'm saying? And it, it has more of an appeal. But I can take two different colors <clears throat> I can take two different colors and do that but what you have to do before you ever cut it you always put some registration lines take your square and put you some registration lines across there so that when I cut it you might try to put this together like that and it looks all right, but you're going to have a crack. You don't notice it until you get ready to sand it. But when you do that, when you put your registration lines, I'll make it thick enough where it's show up on camera. What I'm doing, is this showing up now? What I'm doing is pulling this so I'm more concerned with these lines being straight across. And that means that all of my uh, angle, everything is going to pull up tight. 
is that and once I clamp this now what you have to do when you're clamping stuff like this forget about talking about putting back of boards on here and clamping it it will not work because you got different radiuses at different points and you pull up one but you won't pull the other one up and the thing that you do is everywhere you have a I always call it a, a, a hill or a valley you put a clamp so on a piece this long if I was clamping it I would have six clamps on it minimum and two on the ends and sometimes I get away with six clamps but I have to have one at each spot and you start from the center now what I would do uh, since we're doing that is when I put the clamp on I don't turn the clamp this way I have some smaller clamps I use but I turn the clamp this way it does two things this right here helps to hold this down and I'm just, I put one on each end just to hold it down so the stuff doesn't slide up and down then I will turn these then I can turn these this way just enough to hold this together but I start clamping from the center. As I start clamping from the center, the pieces in the middle I have to push them down. The reason is, every time I made a cut, this might not be exactly perpendicular right here. So as I pull this piece up right here, it's going to want to do one of those numbers. You, you follow what I'm getting at? So I have to constantly be kind of pushing it down. So I can get away with it not being perfect, perfectly perpendicular in my cuts. All right? And you start putting your clamps on from the center, and you don't tighten them all the way, and you work your way out, one here and one going this way evenly. All right? Then I'll check everything and make sure everything is lined up and down. Then I start tightening from the center. You have to get used to how much to tighten with your clamps. I got some Bessie clamps that were made in Germany. The threads, a small turn gives me a lot more torque. I got something that was made here in America, and I got to turn it two times to get the same torque. And I don't like them as good as I do the old ones. So you get used to whatever clamps you're using as to how much you tighten them. All right, and the whole secret is not over tightening because you can squeeze all the glue out to where you actually got a dry joint. It'll stay together and one day all of a sudden it pops loose. If your glue joint comes loose, like I said, some mistake we use in using the wrong glue. We over tighten it or we try to fill up gaps with the glue. The pieces weren't flat, weren't fitting flat or whatever. And they're going to tell on you one day. So if you do a good glue joint, it makes everything worthwhile. All right. We're going to that side now, Carl. Any questions so far? All right. What I want to do is, as I'm... As I'm shaping this blade on the sander, sometimes I'm trying to get it to a point coming out and I'm shaping the shoulders. But I have to constantly look at it to see whether or not the blade is straight. Sometimes the blade will be straight but it'll be twisted on the bottom. So it means that part on the bottom, when I sand it, I need to sand it so I can straighten the bottom up. Now in doing that, the blade might want to be that much shorter. But I'm constantly looking at the blade both ways to make sure it's kind of straight. Then I get to shaping the profile this way. But I'm more concerned now with shaping the profile this way. How are you folks today? Now, well, I said we were going to be through by now. I'm going to show you the process and I won't go through the whole process, okay? A lot of people don't use the end of the belt sander and they don't use the fence. Now, two things I'll show you. I can demonstrate. I use this piece. I'm going to assume that this is the end of one of the leather openers and the handle for it. And I'm going to round it over basically on the belt sander. Alright. And when I do that, I actually use the, the fence on the belt sander. I'll do it one way, flip it over and do it the other way and you look at it and you can do it real light or real heavy and you know to kind of round things over. With this what I'm doing 
as I'm shaping, I'm kind of holding this part up a little bit. I'm shaping it down. Now, when it gets to here, I'm going to actually let it ride up over here, and I have to look at it, and yet I can touch it lightly. I can even turn it around. Since this is round, I don't want to touch this. I actually, because of the way I was holding up on the table, this normally I wouldn't come up that far. So if I touch this a little bit, don't worry about it. Uh, I'll show you just be the way it is for this demonstration. side to side because I want it to have an oval effect on both sides. And I'm doing this is not going to be perfect. I'm doing it in a hurry. Normally I'm sitting at my table on a stool and I can sit here and do this real easily. 120 sandpaper? All I use is 120. Yeah. Then I go to the palm sander with 120 and finish it up. The reason this is not going to come out as good and doing a jigsaw thing up like I was doing, this is really too far down. This should stop right, right, right here. That gives me a chance to really shape the shoulder and not come into here. You understand? But I just want to show you the process I'm using to do this. This same process I use to shape all of those. Take care of that. 
And then I shaped it, kind of do the shape this way. All right, so I want to come down. I don't want this to be too thin because I want it to still be good and strong. Now, to get get it finer all the way around, I'll go to the palm center. What I want you to watch is from here down, how finished it's going to be when I come off the palm center with it. And still I'm using 120 grit paper. All right. Oh, man, I got to bring this thing back. <laughs> We just won't, we'll probably be through in about 10 minutes. Is it all right? Oh, you're fine. You're saying in different places. The one on the other workbench, if you turn it sideways, you can pull it out as far as you want, and you put oh, it in okay. the same way. This one doesn't work that way. I'm trying to make a basket for you. I've been using this little jig, like I said, 17, 18, 20 years. It's about worn out. I had some, a lot of padding on it at first, and I broke. I dropped my sand and broke something on it also. I left the paper off so you can see me put the paper on it. It's, it, it's not a... This is regular palm sander. It moves in two different directions. The, the uh, random orbital will move in a lot more different directions. That's the big difference. For most of the small stuff I deal with, I couldn't use a random orbital sander. I got one at home, I very seldom use it. I got two of these and I just about worn both of them out. Uh, but this is what I use to do most of my shape, my finish sanding on, on the lead openers. And I use a little hand sanding also. Now, if I'm doing hand sanding, I will go to 180. And that might be an occasion, very rarely, I didn't mean to cut that that long, but that's all right. Very rarely, where if I'm hand sanding, I might have to go to 220. Because my hands won't move the same way that this does. All the sanding is really doing, when you go from one grit to the other one, uh, what these, these sanders do, and the random order sander, it makes the scratches go so fine in different directions that I can't pick them up. That's all they do. Uh, you can hand sand smooth, but you'll see the scratches because they're going to be in one direction in most cases. So like I say, what we're going to primarily do, don't worry about this because this is irrelevant right now. From here, this way is where I'm doing the finish sanding. Okay, because I did a hurry cutting this thing off.
and actually, like I said, my part been broken off, and the padding is worn down. It vibrates on the wood more. Increase that sound. Even when you have a yeah. new one. Well, when I had, well, when it was in better shape and the padding up under there was better, it was just wasn't real loud. Uh, like I say, look at the finish from here down, and this is actually. This tip is a little thin. I, I wanted. I would probably, if I was in the shop, I would round it down again and make it just a little. I like for the tip to be stronger. And this is all right, except on one side, I can feel it's weak. So if I test each one, if they feel too weak, you don't want something somebody to take home and chip the first thing. But I don't want you to see the process I use to basically do that. Now, even with the handle, if I can take the handle and do that on that sander and get it smooth. But even if it comes off there smooth, then mm -hmm. it takes very little sanding. But the ends, I can take the ends and kind of round them over smooth and all that stuff. So that, uh, you know, that's the way all, all of these were done. Once I came off of the, you know, lathe, then I can see around them over. Now the tip where I cut it off, I left that flat. It was easier to leave it flat and make it look a little different. Is this a piece of maple? Yeah, try it around it. That's a piece of maple. Now that's soft maple. I don't use hard maple too much. Uh, it's too hard to work with. It's too hard on my tooth. It'll do my blades faster. Uh, it's just hard to work with. It's pretty. But most of the maple I use is soft maple. Uh, the only problem about when I do demonstration is so many things I don't show you. But anyway, like I say, this is a piece of scrap chair. I'm going to make a letter over now, I haven't figured out whether I want to make it this end. I think this is going to be the handle, and this is going to be the blade. All right. That's the same way these were made. You can come up and look at any of them. And these are all some scrap pieces of something I, I did. This was done just like I told you, showed you how to do the other one. Then you shape it. Uh, this one was just a straight cut. So that you still make them where they look different. This was done that other way. Uh, and like I say, what I do sometimes when I do the, uh, does anybody want to see how I put the inlay into? Oh, let me tell you this right quick. I'm going to hold you up. When I get ready to do these, where I'm gluing the handle on each side, mm -hmm. I need to be able to get to this point where where I'm gluing the handles on. And the reason I need this to be square, when you make a transition coming down, if it's not recessed in there, you're going to get a raggedy look on the edges that will not be pleasing where it's going. Well, when you start making a transition where they just glued flat, when you start making a transition coming in any kind of way, when you hit that other wood, you're going to get something that's not good looking. So you want the handle to look like it's made into the wood. So that's why I started doing this. Alright, now the way I do that is you take a piece on my router table, my fence is here, with my push thing I set the router bit up, I got a um, quarter inch bit or inch bit or whatever it is, and I make a pass this way and this way once I set the height. That that locks, that makes this shoulder right here. I will move my fence over and I make another pass the same way using my block and I'll create this shoulder here. Alright, now I'll move my fence out to where only half the router bit is showing and I will take off, when I do this part, I take this part, half of it off I flip it over and take the other half off. Then I move my router fence back to where it's on the outer half. And I take the other part off. So I wind up with something that's similar to this. All right. Now I need to get it from this stage where I've already gotten it to. I left this on for demonstration purposes. I need to get it from here to there. And what I do then is I cut this off, this tip. I only needed the tip so when I'm routing it, I got something to press down on, otherwise this would be flapping. Everybody understand? That's what I'm doing? All right. Once I get to this point, 
that sanding block I had, no, here it is. I put sandpaper on here, but I make sure that it's not exactly to the edge, it's right at the edge. Because what I want to do now is I want to sand this whole thing flat. And the way I do that is this is stuck on the table and I can slide straight here. I want to keep this straight. I don't want to dig in. I don't want to dig into this part. So by using a block like this, I can keep it straight and I can look at it. And once I get it straight now, I will take, depending on what sides I'm putting on there, if it's designed like this, where I want it to be like this, I put the design together, I go to my saw, and I cut them all so that both of these tips are in the same identical spot. So when I put it on the sides and push it tight up against it, that's going to keep the design exactly where I, this design exactly where I want it. Now the second thing I can do to dress it up some, if you look at each one of these, there's a little thin contrasting piece here. On this one is pink. Okay, and the way you do that is I'll cut off a small piece. And it's glued in here. Alright. I have another piece that's glued in there. I'm putting glue on all these at the same time. Then when I put these on, they got glue on them. But what you have to do is, this is flat. So I will cut this off straight. This has to be shorter than this. No longer than this. Because when I put my clamp on the same way I clamp the others, when I clamp it this way, I'm clamping from here to here. No, 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 no. no. These, this centerpiece has to be shorter than the two end pieces. Because my clamp, I'll put a, a thick wide piece at the back pushing both of these up. So that I can keep this pushed up against this little piece here. Then I put my clamps on here and it's a process of tightening all of them slowly so that you want to keep all of them there until they dry. Is that kind of clear? And uh, like I said, there's a lot of different ways I do a lot of different letter openers. And sometimes I have to think for a minute to remember all the different jigs and ways you do it. But I don't use any complicated jigs. I use basically what you see here. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned that you use uh, nine wood. Do you buy that in different thicknesses or do you have... Most of it will come in this, whatever they call it. Uh, the reason is... is Yes, a, I want to say it's a 64th or something like that, uh, 32nd or whatever. The reason is, and the reason these are soft hardwoods also, is that the, the, the pigmentations they put in it has to go all the way through the wood. And they will only penetrate so far into the fibers. You can dye wood yourself on the outside, but as soon as you sand it, it's gone. Now, they usually the black... The black, when it's black, you can usually get it in thicker colors because the black, for some reason, will go further in, whatever process they use. But most of this is thin stuff. So you have to put several pieces together. If you want, if you wanted a yellow piece, say a little thicker than this, you just have to put several yellows together. Buy that locally? Uh, I will email, what I will do is, I will make sure I send the information to Rob, and I meant to brought it with me, I didn't. Uh, some of the companies I used to get stuff from are uh, out of business. Uh, I know they sell these here, but this strip I used to get, uh, I found somebody who was real reasonable, but they went out of business. And I found another company I could get some from when I ordered it. It's so thin, it was so thin, I was the hard with it. There was some other, the other company I've ordered some stuff from, little pieces to try. And some of these designs, when you look at it, if I do that, they just fall apart. Because they didn't actually glue, they cut them, but they didn't glue them properly. So it's not as good as the stuff you used to get. So, you know, I have to note, George, but what I do is I will send Rob a list of where I get different things from, and he can pass it on to the church. You say the double-sided tape you used, did you get here? Is it this stuff? Yeah, in fact, we did a demonstration here, what, a couple of years ago? And uh, that's when they brought it in. 
because you as a member cook, you had to buy it in a case. When I bought mine, I bought it in a case because I used a lot of it. But it's like, what, 30 some rolls in a case. And it would take you forever to use up 30 rolls. But uh, Peace Street brought it in. They have some other two sided tape, too. By the, way, that, by the way, the two sided tape they have here, we have a special. Yeah. Did you buy some? How much you pay for it? Uh, it's uh, $9.99. You can tell it was $9.99. White water, yeah. But it's, uh, I use a lot of it, and I used to buy it at Home Depot years ago, the extra thick copper tape. It was good, and it held, but it was thicker, but the stuff they started making had a lot of residue, so when you press it together, you'd have all that crap in your wood, you never would get it out. And uh, when I found that uh, at a company, I loved it because it was masking tape, and I didn't think it would hold that good, but... You know, it actually holds. Pretty good demonstration it, today. Well, things I do with, I, when I started, believe it or not, I'll say this and then we end it. When I started doing a lot of the stuff I'm doing 20, 25 years ago, there was nobody using two sided tape. You didn't see it in any magazine. And I tell people I'm doing class, I take credit for inventing it, whatever. They use some for turning, you know, a little. But nobody I used two sided tape. You know, I, when you're making like the yeah. letters and different things, well, I'm saying Turner's like use it now, like it. Yeah. but 25 years ago or so, oh, nobody no. used it. Nobody used colored woods. And uh, I still hadn't good. found anybody to do the cutting methods and things that I do. That, that's the happiest I'm about that God allowed me to develop these to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. But it also means that people can have more fun making some things they never thought about making. And I got a good friend of mine, Michael Gilmartin. Uh, you know, we did a meeting over at his shop. <laughs> and uh, he's a master woodworker. He makes some gorgeous furniture out of plywood and other stuff. I was talking to him one day. This is after we did our meeting. And I was telling him, I said, you know, Michael, I don't do the kind of stuff you do, but I do stuff to show people how to be safe. And I started talking about two-sided tape. He said, that stuff really holds like that, so the next time I come, I'm going to do a demonstration for you. So I carried some tape out of him, a little dial, and did the same thing I did here. He sat there with his mouth open, wide open. He was fascinated. Now, when, we, when I got through doing what I did, he went and pulled something out of a drawer, some little pieces he was trying to cut. He couldn't cut them. All right. But what I, what I was getting to is not that uh, it's something, what, regardless of what kind of furniture you make, sometimes you want to put a little design or something in it. By being able to hold it with two sides of tape and cut something, you can put a design you couldn't do otherwise. And uh, it makes life a lot simpler for me because, like I say, with the stick I use to hold stuff down, I can cut, and I'll say this without going into it. If I wanted to cut, I can cut any angle I want to cut on my table saw, my regular arm saw, my regular arm saw will stay at 90 degrees. I never change it. All right? And I can cut boxes out. I can do whatever, and it would be at the same angle. I can put, it's got two sided tape on it. If I want to cut something at Say 45 degrees, and my regular arm saw, my miter saw set up at 90 degrees. All I do is pull my saw out, put this up against the blade. That sets my angle. This is my 45 degree angle. Now, I can slide this in. So this is now set up at 45 degrees. This is my new fence. All right, I can put a mark on the table, take the tape off. I can stick this down where it needs to go. If I want to cut, say I want to cut this at 45 degrees. All I do is bring it to there. Now I can bring the tip of this to right here. If I'm, I'll usually push this out enough to where I make a cut right on this. So now that end right here is where the saw blade is going to exit. Okay. So whatever I want to do. I want to make something where I don't want to take any more wood off the front side. I can take all my pieces of wood. I can cut them square. I can bring each one of them right here and clamp it and cut it. I can turn it over and cut it. So when I got ready to do, where's my box? I want to make a box like this. I can do it by doing that. This one little side. By bringing this right here, 
I can bring it right there. Now if I want to make it half this, by clamping this down, I can come right here. I can take this same stick, wherever it is, oh, okay. I can put some sandpaper on it, I can take this same stick. Alright, I put a wider piece here, I can hold that piece right there and cut it on my, I can do all of them like that. I cut one angle, I turn it over and I cut the other angle, so now I'm cutting something this half this wide, so I can make a box that small. You understand what I'm doing? And my fingers are still in the same place, so that's what the methods and techniques that I kind of, uh, God allowed me to develop, allow me to do some funny cutting with small stuff that a lot of other people don't do. So, any other questions? All right. Appreciate it. With that, I hope you. <laughs> but, uh, thank you.